is marking up and reporting resolutions and postal naming bills. Uh, we have scheduled this markup so we can bring resolutions dealing with recent events to the floor quickly, and I thank the ranking member for working with us on these bills. I want to ask uh, unanimous consent that these measures be considered in block and as read and open to amendment at any point. Uh, is there any objection? Seeing hearing none, uh, the bills include House Res 299, introduced by Stephen Lynch. This measure expresses the sense of the House that public servants should be commended for their dedication and continued service to the nation during Public Service Recognition Week, May 4th through 10th, 09, and throughout the year. Uh, the second one is House Res 340, introduced by Representative Maurice Henchy. Uh, this measure expresses sympathy to the victims, families, and friends of the tragic act of violence at the American Civic Association in Binghamton, New York. Number three, House Res 3, 341, introduced by Representative Bobby Bright. This measure expresses heartfelt sympathy for the victims and families of the shootings in Geneva and Coffee Counties in Alabama on March 10, 2009. And uh, House Res 342 introduced by Representative Ann Joseph Gow. Um, this measure expresses support for the designation of May 2nd, 09 as Vietnamese Refugees Day. H.R. 1271 introduced by Representative Alcee Hastings. The measure designates a facility of the U.S. Postal Service in Pompano Beach, Florida as the Elijah Pat Larkins Post Office Building. These are all worthy measures that meet our committee standards, and I urge their adoption. Uh, does the ranking member have any comments? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have reviewed each of these uh, resolutions and postal namings and find them to meet the committee standard. Additionally, I want to thank the majority, uh, the chairman and yourself, for uh, working so quickly to bring these important resolutions to the uh, uh, floor, hopefully next week. And uh, again, uh, this is part of the, the new, just in time, we can get this done committee. And I yield back. Thank you for that input. Uh, do any other members wish to speak on these bills? Uh, seeing none, I uh, uh, ask you unanimous consent that the measures previously described be reported favorably by the committee uh, without objection. So ordered. Uh, this concludes our business for today. The business meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start in about five minutes.
Committee will come to order. Good morning. Buenos dias. Namaste. I want to thank the witnesses for being here. I'm Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. I'm here with the ranking member of the committee, uh, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. And uh, this committee today meets uh, the title of the hearing is the H-2B Guest Worker Program and Improving the Department of Labor's Enforcement of the Rights of Guest Workers. Uh, we have a panel of witnesses who is prepared to testify. Uh, today's hearing is going to uh, uh, go into issues of enforcement and uh, particularly with respect to labor rights for non-agricultural guest workers who come to the United States lawfully through the H-2B visa program. Now, without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. This hearing, the H-2B Guest Worker Program and Improving the Department of Labor's Enforcement of the Rights of Guest Workers, continues an investigation that this subcommittee began in 2007, evaluating the adequacy of labor law enforcement in New Orleans during the period following Hurricane Katrina. During the course of our investigation and the two hearings we held on labor law enforcement in New Orleans, the subcommittee discovered that H-2B visa holders who are non-agricultural guest workers have been exposed to egregious forms of abuse by sponsoring employers who brought them to the Gulf Coast to assist with the cleanup. These abuses include wage theft, poor living conditions, and threatening actions which amount to the human trafficking. Unfortunately, it is clear that the abuse of guest workers continues today in New Orleans and across the country. Today we will hear testimony from three guest workers, all of whom worked in different industries that the Department of Labor allows to hire foreign guest workers. Take, for example, the case of one of our witnesses, uh, Abby Karikathara Raju, who came to the United States from India to work for Signal International LLC at the Golf Course Shipyard. Lured by false promises of permanent U.S. residency, Mr. Draju, along with hundreds of other Indian guest workers, paid tens of thousands of dollars to obtain this job with Signal, only to have their passports confiscated and find themselves forced into involuntary servitude, working for substandard wages and living in overcrowded, guarded labor camps. Unfortunately, these cases of worker abuse have gone largely unprosecuted by the federal cop on a workplace beat. The Department of Labor did virtually nothing to protect these workers. The explanation has two components. First, there are very limited legal protections in place for H-2B uh, work, uh, workers. Unlike H-2A guest workers, H-2B guest workers do not have legal access or do not have access to legal services do not have protection from retaliation or payment of transportation to the United States. Second, the Department of Labor has utterly failed to enforce the rights of H-2B guest workers. The Department of Labor has interpreted the Immigration and Nationality Act and its implementing regulations to preclude Department of Labor authority to enforce the conditions of H-2B visa petitions in favor of Homeland Security's enforcement authority. At our hearing in June 2007, when we questioned former Department of Labor officials about why the abuse of guest workers in New Orleans had gone unchecked, we were told to ask the Department of Homeland Security. While that is debatable, Department of Labor itself has acknowledged it still maintains authority to oversee wage and hour laws which apply to guest workers. Based on this subcommittee scrutiny, advocacy by labor groups as well as recent reports by the uh, GAO, however, it's clear that the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division 
has failed to do even that. There is a development in the law that requires mentioning as well. If the previous administration passed a midnight regulation that weakens instead of strengthening protections for H-2B visa guest workers. The new regulation is also extremely harmful to U.S. workers because it makes easier for employers to bring in guest workers for longer periods of time, reducing or increasing the risk that U.S. workers will be overlooked for a cheaper, less regulated labor source. Congressman Miller, Chairman of the Committee on Education and Labor, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, Chairman of the Immigration Subcommittee of Judiciary, have been working tirelessly on and will soon be introducing a new bill that will increase protections for both H-2B guest workers and U.S. workers. This subcommittee supports and applauds those efforts. The current weak regulatory framework for the H-2B visa program cannot be allowed to stand. The one silver lining in the previous administration's midnight regulation is the delegation of authority by DHS to the Department of Labor to establish an enforcement procedure to investigate compliance with H-2B requirements and remedy violations uncovered as a result by imposing fines or debarment. Many questions remain about the nature of that delegation and how DOL's oversight and enforcement of the H-2B visa will be carried out. But the acknowledgement by uh, both uh, Homeland Security and Labor that uh, Labor has clear authority to enforce the rights of H-2B guest workers give this subcommittee hope that the Department of Labor will finally commit to investigating and prosecuting H-2B sponsoring employers who are abusing the program and exploiting workers. We had hoped to hear from Labor Secretary Hilda Solis today on the Department of Labor's plans to improve such oversight. Uh, but we understand that the Department is still in the policy development stage. And the Department asks that it be allowed to testify at, at a later date once the Senate has confirmed the Assistant Secretary for the Employment Standards Administration and an Administrator of the Wage and Hour Division. We're hopeful that the Department will consider the testimony presented in today's hearing as they draw conclusions about what needs to be done with the H-2B visa program. Uh, this subcommittee certainly intends to see that uh, Secretary Solis's introductory remarks to the Department of Labor that there's a new sheriff in town will benefit the lives and working conditions of guest workers. Today, I hope we can better understand the problems faced by guest workers and how the Department of Labor uh, in the past has failed them. We're lucky to have a very strong panel of labor advocates who can shed light on how to create a stronger Department of Labor that can fulfill its mission of protecting the rights of all workers. Uh, I want to thank you again for being here, thank my colleagues who are present, uh, and uh, now turn to the uh, ranking member of this subcommittee, uh, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. You may thank, proceed. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for putting this hearing together and for uh, the great working, working relationship I have with uh, with you, uh, fellow Ohioan, and, and uh, thank our panel, uh, first panel and our second panel as well. Uh, this hearing provides an excellent opportunity to discuss and debate the existing H-2B guest worker program and the newly delegated enforcement of H-2B violations to the Department of Labor. This is an important matter, and I look forward to having a productive discussion on the many issues surrounding the present H-2B visa program and their economic implications. We all agree that enforcement of the law and protection of guest workers is critical. Many organizations and individuals, including some that we will hear from later, have advocated for substantial reforms to the H-2B guest worker program. Indeed, some of these proposed reforms might be helpful, but let's also keep in mind today that implementing many of the suggested policy changes may require Congress to entirely overhaul the guest worker program. As a result, our discussion needs to also examine how reforming the current program will affect the economy and U.S. workers. Being a representative from Ohio, a state struggling with economic hardship and the housing crisis, this is an issue that hits close to home. In 1986, Congress passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act. The act contained major revisions of the temporary worker H-2 program. Specifically, it divided the H-2 program into two separate visa categories. The H-2A program for temporary agriculture workers and the new H-2B was created for temporary non-agriculture workers. Today's hearing will focus on the existing H-2B program. On January 18, 2009, the Department of Homeland Security delegated its enforcement authority of H-2B violations to the Labor Department. I would like to emphasize that prior to this delegation, H-2B violations went largely unenforced by DHS. Without a doubt, the failure to enforce existing laws is unacceptable. Prior to January 18, 2009, Labor's enforcement of H-2B wages was limited to laws specifically delegated to the Department of Labor, such as the Fair Labor Standards Act. However, following the delegation of enforcement by DHS, the Department of Labor immediately promulgated regulations that would enforce the H-2B program. As it now stands, H-2B employer will have to make certain guarantees to the Department of Labor regarding their hiring of H-2B workers. 
Most relevant to today's hearing, it is important for this subcommittee to take into consideration that an H-2B employer must attest and demonstrate that qualified persons in the United States are not available and that the terms of employment will not adversely affect the wages and working conditions of the workers in the United States similarly employed. These employer attestation requirements for the H-2B application provide a foundation to prevent employer violations while at the same time encourage employers to use U.S. workers. Now that DHS has delegated to DOL, or Department of Labor Enforcement Authority, for the H-2B violations, the Department of Labor has supplemented U.S. worker protection with new mechanisms to ensure compliance with H-2B filing and, att and, and attestation requirements including penalties, debarment, supervised pre-filing recruitment and post-adjudication audits. In short, the Department of Labor now has the authority and capability to enforce the H-2B violations. Unfortunately, the change in administration and the slow appointment process has left the Department of Labor with a limited man management staff and no one who is capable of testifying on the implementation of the H-2B program in present, is present today. No accurate assessment of the H-2B regulations can be made without a representative from the Department of Labor. But it appears that the Department of Labor has failed to implement any of the new H-2B regulations laid out above. I hope to eventually hear, as the Chairman indicated in his opening statement, the Administration's perspective on the H-2B program before this subcommittee. In fact, I think the words the Chairman used were the Department of Labor has utterly failed uh, in many of the things we're talking about today. The Department of Labor should be given a chance to enforce the regulations promulgated on January 18, 2009. To be sure, once the existing regulations are enforced, Congress and the Department of Labor will be in a better position to assess the H-2B visa program. However, before Congress and the Department of Labor can seriously consider future changes to the H-2B program, the broader economic implications of the guest worker program must be thoroughly examined and discussed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today. These issues not only affect our home state of Ohio, but also the entire United States. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I, I, I thank the gentleman. I just. Uh uh, want to say that I appreciate the chance to work with you. And the one good thing about this uh, domestic policy subcommittee, as with all subcommittees of government oversight, is that, um, and this doesn't relate specifically to the Department of Labor, but to any government agency or department, that we generally get their cooperation. And that's okay. nice. Okay. That has nothing to do with the fact that we have subpoena power, by the way. Um, Mr. Uh, Foster, uh, Chair recognizes you for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, while today's hearing will no doubt have wider implications on labor policy and the economy, this is also an opportunity to further understanding and address the sh administrative shortcomings within the Labor Department in this area. In previous hearing, the subcommittees investigated labor law enforcement and protection by, of guest workers by the Department of Labor in the aftermath of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, and has uncovered cases of abuse by sponsoring employees during the, employers during the Gulf Coast cleanup. Um, today, however, we may gain a clearer view of nationwide patterns of abuse and fraud within our guest worker programs and begin to devise rigorous reporting and accountability measures to ensure the Department of Labor asks, asks, acts swiftly and to uncover abuse and enforce existing labor laws. In a recent report, the GAO noted that the Labor Department's Wage and Hour Division, the body charged with administering laws like the Fair Labor Standards Act and the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act, insufficiently responds to reports of abuse and fails to consistently enforce the terms of guest worker labor certifications, which designate wages and work schedules. Many of today's witnesses will correctly point out the vulnerability of guest workers who have to, no leverage to bargain for higher wages or better working conditions. This, the downward pressure on wages that results from this lack of enforcement is not only exploitative for the guest worker, but also means that jobs become increasingly undesirable for U.S. workers. I look forward to hearing from each of our witnesses on the ways the bureaucracy can be made more responsive and accountable, including any proposals for publicizing patterns of abuse and fraud. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Foster. Uh, does Mr. Tierney have an opening statement? I know I don't, Mr. Chairman, other than thank you for having this hearing. And uh, as always, you're looking out for people's rights, and we appreciate that. Thank you for being on the subcommittee. Ms. Uh, Ms. Watson, do you have an opening statement? I do. Chair recognizes a uh, distinguished lady from California, uh, uh, Ambassador Watson. I also want to thank the Chairman for holding today's important hearing examining the state of H-2B non-agricultural guest worker visa program. I sincerely hope that today's proceedings 
will reveal the weaknesses associated with the program and the steps that can be taken to strengthen the rights and protections for H-2B visa holders. Previous hearings and investigations conducted by this subcommittee revealed serious abuse by sponsoring employers in the Gulf Coast during the cleanup after Hurricane Katrina. Unfortunately, these practices were not isolated incidents, but representative of similar abuses which occur across the country due to the un even power dynamic between guest workers and their employers, and an ineffective system within the Department of Labor to regulate employers who violate labor laws. Due to the loophole in H-2B regulations and the assertion that enforcement of labor laws affecting these guest workers was outside the authority of the Department of Labor, this program has operated with essentially no enforcement mechanism or penalties for employers who violate their guest workers' rights. A new Department of Labor regulation on December 19, 2008, solidified the notion that enforcement authority was it within the jurisdiction of the Department of Labor. But while this was a positive step its practical application has proven to be unevenly flawed. According to a March 2009 report by the GAO, the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division processes for complaint intake, uh, conciliation, and investigation are so ineffectual they actually discourage, discourage workers from making complaints. Healthy immigration and labor policy needs to be based upon the premise of fair wages for honest work in a safe environment. Employers who rely on, upon temporary foreign workers must operate under this principle with the knowledge if they are in violation, they will be investigated and penalized by the Department of Labor. With the advent of a new administration and a new Secretary of Labor, this hearing occurs at an opportune moment to assess current practices and to reveal the actions needed to protect the rights of all guest workers. And I would like all of today's panelists, I would like to thank them for participating. And sharing your experiences will help us ensure Future guest workers in the H-2B visa program are empowered with the proper rights and the necessary infrastructure to protect you. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time and again, thank you. I thank the gentlelady and if there are no additional opening statements from members of the subcommittee, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses I want to start by introducing our first panel. Uh, Mr. Abby Karikathara Raju, is that, did I pronounce that right? Okay. Is a former H-2B guest worker for Signal International LLC. Mr. Raju is a structural welder from Kerala, India. He's a member of the Alliance of Guest Workers for Dignity. Mr. Miguel Angel Ovel Lopez is a former H-2B guest worker for Cumberland Environmental Resources. He came to the U.S. from El Salvador and works as a construction laborer. He is also a member of the Alliance of Guest Workers for Dignity. Mr. Daniel Castellanos Contreros is a former H-2B guest worker for Decatur Hotels, LLC. He came to the U.S. from Peru, where he is a licensed engineer and formerly owned a small business. He's an organizer and founding member of the Alliance of Guest Workers for Dignity. I want to thank you for appearing before this subcommittee today. Now, we also have two interpreters. And I would like the interpreters, uh, if you would please identify yourself, your name, uh, where you're from, uh, and if the uh, 
court stenographer uh, can also take that information and members of the committee can be aware of it. If you'd start with Mr. Uh, Raju's uh, interpreter, your name. Could you please turn on the... Okay. My name is Bincy Jacob. I work with the New Orleans Worker Center for Racial Justice. And um, uh, would you spell your last name? Sure, it's J-A-C-O-B. Okay. Yes, sir. My name is Jacob Horwitz. I also work with the New Orleans Worker Center for Racial Justice, and that's H-O-R-W-I-T-Z. Thanks for having us. Okay, uh, now it is, uh, it's the policy of this subcommittee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Uh, since we have uh, individuals who are interpreting, we're going to ask that you be sworn as well. So I would ask that all witnesses please rise. And please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, let the record reflect that each witness answered in the affirmative. I would ask the witnesses now to give a brief summary of their testimony and to try to keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Since we're working with interpreters, we may have to give a little bit of play to that, but just I want you to keep in mind that your written statement will be included in the hearing record. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions about that, by the way? Do you have any questions about this procedure? No? no. Okay. We're all set? Okay, let's, let's proceed then with uh, Mr. Raju. Thank you. And, and please uh, speak into the mic uh, as best you can, and the interpreter uh, can go back and forth. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Ebi Karikatra Raju. We're going to have to ask you to bring that mic a little okay. bit closer to both of you and just you kind of move it back and forth. Go ahead. I came to this country as a guest worker on an H2B visa from India. I'm here to share with you the experiences of what I saw and I heard and I felt in my life as a guest worker in this country. Company name, recruiters in name, labor trafficking in a Faramai, Randai theatre to Marchil, Nangal Idinur, Molil Pair, Campbell in the Odi Rashabatu, or a lawsuit filed Chizu. In 2008, as a result of the company and the recruiters' labor trafficking, over 200 of us escaped the labor camps and found refuge. Signalum, recruitersum, Palatata, Vagdan and Nalgi, Nangal in them, Idivanidum, Dollar Varavangi, H2B. Signal and the recruiters lied to us and gave us false promises of H-2B visas with permanent resident visas and collected up to $20,000 from each of us. And not only that, when we came here, we had to live in very poor conditions and work under very poor conditions. And for those of us who spoke up against it, they tried to forcefully deport and threaten them. Prayer meeting in one pastor put our security guard in the gate. They used the security guards to hold back the pastor who came to help us to have a prayer meeting. And these are the reasons why we had to raise our voice and file a lawsuit. Unfortunately, we have yet to receive justice from any government agency. Advocates told us that there are laws in this country to protect workers like us, but we have not received any justice. We really believe that you and Congress created these laws to protect us. But the truth is we haven't received any of the benefits of these laws. And 
Since coming to this country, I had never heard of the Department of Labor. This department is not in the camp. Not a single person from this department came to where we lived or to our work site and conducted an inspection. Camp in the Mosama, I was a petty paradi petapol company where I knew E. Camp Camp U.S. Los Pragar Molan. When we complained about the poor conditions in the camp, the company told us this camp is under the U.S. laws. Subdom Yerti workers in a armed security guards in a VH Loki, Belamai deported Jan Sermicha company where I knew the immigration and Radesa Pragaramana Idanana. When the company used armed guards to lock up workers and try to forcibly deport them, the company told us that we are doing this because immigration told us. Department of Justice, Department of Labor, my chair and the Pravartikin and Pagaram, immigration my work is Edu, Adinisham, immigration, Yangal Damil, surveillance, and the Yundai. When we filed a lawsuit, instead of the Department of Justice working with the Department of Labor to help, Department of Justice worked with immigration, and after that, we had surveillance over us. Yangal Ipurum, government agency, will do decision in the Kathirigian. And we are still awaiting the decision of a government agency. Foreign worker, E. Rajitwanal, Department of Labor, Neritwana, Inspection Narthandana. If a foreign worker comes to this country, the Department of Labor should directly go and do an inspection. Our living condition, our work condition better on our Jolly Arm begin in Mumbai and Orpo Retendana. Before the work even starts, they have to ensure that the living conditions and working conditions are good enough for them to, to stay there. One guest worker, Munotovana, Ayal Kanubig and the Karing Lapet report to Jambol, Department of Labor, Matter Agency, and my chair, and the investigation that the event and nobody will see it again. When a worker comes forward and makes a complaint about what they experience, the Department of Labor should work with other agencies to see what the investigation should be and to move forward correctly. In a Munotovana worker, some day she can vendi our Metter employed a Kedil, Uru Joliki, Ila Sahaiki, and Chay the Ila Samdishi and the Sahangudi Chandan. And not only that, for workers who come forward, the Department of Labor can support them in finding another employer so that they can be safe in this country. Idru Matrame, Department of Labor, trafficking in the system, Ira Taran Sadigon and Yamisusin. And I truly believe that it's only with these steps that the Department of Labor can help stop trafficking in this country. Thank you. Danyavad, Mr. Lopez, you may proceed. Bueno, mi nombre es Miguel Ángel, soy de El Salvador, y vengo a exponer mi experiencia, mi testimonio, lo que he estado viviendo hasta ahorita en el país de los Estados Unidos. My name is Miguel Ángel, I'm from El Salvador, and I've come here to, to share and expose my testimony, what I've been living and experiencing in the United States. Yo vine con una visa H2B de El Salvador, lo cual para, para obtener esta visa yo tuve que endeudarme en mi país como con cuatro mil dólares y hasta ahorita no he salido todavía de mi deuda. In order for me to come to this country from El Salvador on an H2B visa, I had to indebt myself and my family four thousand dollars, and I still haven't gotten out of this debt. Soy padre de familia, soy eh, tengo una hija, una esposa. Cuatro hermanos que dependen de mí y hasta ahorita no he satisfecho ninguno de los sueños que traía hacia el país de los Estados Unidos. I'm the head of my household. I have a young daughter, a wife, and four younger brothers that depend on me. And since I've come here, I haven't satisfied even one of my hopes of coming to the United States. Me prometieron muchas cosas en mi país. Luego cuando llego acá, este, las promesas eran completamente falsas. Yo venía a trabajar en recolección de escombros y me mandaron a trabajar en el peligroso trabajo de asbestos. I was promised many things in my home country, but when I arrived, I realized that they were completely false. Instead of working in demolition, which is what I was promised, I was put to work doing uh, asbestos cleanup. La compañía nos rentaba a otras compañías para poder trabajar en, eh, este, en hospitales, trabajos del Estado, en campamentos de, de bases militares y lo que nos pagaban no era lo que la hora estaba, eh, lo que valía la hora que tenía que pagar en, en el trabajo que nosotros hacíamos. 
the company that I was brought to work for rented us out to other contractors, including on government work sites, military bases, hospitals, and universities, and they paid us a small percentage of what the work was really worth. Viendo este, yo y mis compañeros que fuimos despedidos por la compañía Cumberland el 13 de febrero, eh, nos declaramos en huelga y tuvimos que poner una queja al departamento de labor. Seeing all these problems, my coworkers and I began to organize. Uh, we went on strike and were fired, and then we put a complaint in with the Department of Labor uh, in February. Mis compañeros y yo este, pedíamos una reunión con el patrón y para, para hablar sobre el trabajo y, y de los requisitos que, que tiene el, el contrato y el patrón nunca aceptó la reunión con nosotros. Uh, we only wanted to have a meeting with our boss to talk about the requirements of the contract and to talk about uh, the, uh, but our boss never accepted that meeting with us. Tenemos ya dos meses de ver este puesto la, la reportar la, la, la compañía al departamento de labor y hasta ahorita no hemos recibido ninguna respuesta del departamento de labor. Queremos que eh, el departamento de labor eh, ponga manos a esta situación que nosotros hemos vivido desde que regresamos acá al país. So it's been two months since we've reported this abuse to the Department of Labor and still we've heard no response at all. And we want the Department of Labor to really take this case seriously and investigate. Yo como representante de este grupo, eh, pido al Departamento de Labor que investiga a estas compañías a, a que vea que sí cumplan con los contratos y que eh, las personas que traen a trabajar sean... Este, muy tratadas a como dice el contrato. Uh, as a representative of this group of the Alianza, I ask that the Department of Labor investigate these companies, that they make sure that people who are coming to these companies are treated in the way that they're supposed to be treated under the law. También pido una protección a todos los trabajadores que reportan estas compañías para para que no se sientan eh, eh, con miedo de poder reportar a, a cualquier compañía en caso de, de que ellos estén en, un, este, en una protesta de, de, de derechos. Uh -huh. I, I also ask that the Department of Labor offer immigration protection for workers who report companies so that they're not afraid to come forward if they're in a situation where their rights are being taken, taken advantage of. Y que el Departamento de Labor no se tarde en dar una respuesta porque lo que está pasando con nosotros hasta ahorita ya dos meses y no hemos recibido lo que es nada. And we ask for ourselves and everyone else that the Department of Labor doesn't take so long to give a response because we cannot wait. Gracias por darme la oportunidad de exponer mi testimonio. Espero que se haga justicia y que exijan al Departamento de Labor poner manos a los asuntos migratorios y a los de trabajo de visa H2B. Gracias. So thank you for the opportunity uh, to give my testimony. I hope that this results in justice and we demand that the Department of Labor really takes this case seriously and investigates it so that there's justice for us and for all workers. Thank you. Gracias, señor López. Uh, señor Castellanos Contreros. Okay. Um, Buenas, eh, buenas, buenos días. Soy Daniel Castellanos del Perú y vengo en representación de muchos trabajadores huéspedes eh, en los cuales representa la Alianza. Good morning, my name is Daniel Castellanos. I'm from Peru and I come here representing many guest workers that are members of the Alianza. Cuatro mil dólares. Eso es lo que, lo que pagué por venir a los Estados Unidos y dejar a mi familia sumamente endeudada. Four thousand dollars. That's what I paid to come to the United States, leaving my family extremely in debt. En el Perú, eso es lo que yo ahorraría trabajando duro en un año, y solo los ricos lo poseen. In Peru, four thousand dollars is what I would make during a whole year of hard work and an amount of money that only rich people have on hand. Como organizador de la alianza, he conocido a cientos de trabajadores, todos ellos oprimidos por la gran deuda adquirida. Uh, as an organizer with the Alliance, I've known hundreds and hundreds of workers, all of whom have suffered and been oppressed by the huge debt that they have. 
Todo para venir a trabajar acá a los Estados Unidos. All in order to come and work in this country, the United States. Trabajo, trabajadores que vendieron sus cosas e hipotecaron sus casas tratando de alcanzar sus sueños. Workers that sold their houses, mortgaged land, and sold personal family items in order to come. La mayoría de ellos siguen endeudados porque el tiempo de sus visas es demasiado corta y tienen que pagar costosas extensiones para seguir legales. The majority of guest workers continue to be in debt because their visa terms are very short and they have to pay for very expensive extensions which trap them in this cycle of debt. Es por eso que la deuda toma mucha importancia en la relación patrón-empleado. For this reason, the debt is so important in the relation between the boss and the worker. Porque con las regulaciones existentes es una clara violación a la ley de salario mínimo. The current law, with the current regulations, the way debt plays out is a clear violation of the minimum wage. Y además, porque la deuda es lo que mantiene callados a los trabajadores. Also, the debt is what keeps workers silent. Porque si tú protestas, puedes ser despedido, deportado, y nunca llegar a pagar tus deudas. Because if you protest, you could be fired, deported, and never be able to pay that money back. Por eso creemos que el Departamento de Labor Debe de clarificar las reglas de los trabajadores huéspedes. So we believe that the Department of Labor should really take a clear stance on this, on the law around H2B workers. Publicando su posición sobre el costo de venir de los trabajadores es, es una obligación del patrón por ser de su beneficio. And publish the position that the, the fees and the money that workers pay to come to this country are the responsibility and are for the benefit of bosses that bring them to this country. Y debe de pagar esto a los trabajadores en los primeros 15 días de trabajo. And that they should reimburse this money to workers during the first 15 days of their employment. También el Departamento de Labor debería tomar acciones más fuertes para enforzar esta ley. Also, the Department of Labor should take much stronger actions in order to enforce this law. Para así acabar con la servidumbre por deuda que vivimos día a día. So that they can fully eliminate the debt servitude that we live daily. Y de, también debería priorities, priorizar la protección migratoria de los trabajadores huéspedes que tengan disputas laborales con sus patrones. Department of Labor should also prioritize the protection, immigration protection of workers that are in labor disputes with their employers. Porque al no tener protección somos completamente vulnerables a las represalias de los patrones. Because without having protection we're completely vulnerable to retaliation by employers. Nosotros la Alianza de Trabajadores creemos que somos los expertos en la visa H2B. Uh, we of the Alliance of Guest Workers for Dignity, we believe that we're the experts in the H2B visa. Porque lo vivimos a diario. Because we live the experience daily. Es por eso que creemos que debemos ser consultados para las mejoras de las reglas. And so we demand that we be consulted uh, when there's improvements to the law. Sabemos que hay, mucho, hay muchos intereses creados por, por empresas para ampliar el, el, el número de, de visas. We know that there's many interests uh, by companies to expand the number of visas. Pero si no cambian las, las regulaciones y son más humanas a favor de los empleados, esto va a seguir siendo, de, de, va a ir de peor a, a mucho peor. But if the laws don't change so that the workers can come with more human conditions, then this is going to just go from bad to worse. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. I want to uh, thank the witnesses. We are now going to proceed to uh, questions from the committee. I just would like to staff to uh, uh, take note of, of this uh, matter. You know, there are a number of constitutional questions that are being raised by this testimony, uh, including, I think, one that uh, could present an unusual 13th Amendment case, uh, which uh, amendment prohibits slavery and involuntary servitude, because there, there is a condition that we're talking about here that really reflects uh, being coerced into a form of involuntary servitude. And, and I'd like uh, staff to take note of that as a possible uh, uh, course of action that uh, this committee may want to uh, pursue. I'd like to begin my questions with uh, uh, Mr. Raju. Uh, 
I understand that the Department of Labor failed to investigate even the most basic wage violation claims. Have, uh, has the Department of Labor, to your knowledge, done anything to prosecute wage claims since the filing of your lawsuit? Department of Labor, Nangalade, Kaitile, Urigar, Urigarding, Edabated Lana Matravella, Avare, Nangal Campbell Verio, Nangalle, Kiring Lunum, Edabodio Jitilla, Idore. From even coming to the camp in the beginning until this day, I don't believe the Department of Labor has been involved in any part of our. No, no action whatsoever you're, the, that you're aware of. I'm not aware of anything that they've done yet. Okay, staff also is going to have to take note of that uh, testimony. Uh, and, I, and I want to assure uh, you, Mr. Raju, and your fellow plaintiffs that this subcommittee is going to continue to advocate that the Department of Labor and the Department of Justice adequately investigate these allegations of trafficking guest workers. Uh, now, with respect to uh, uh, Senor Lopez, uh, I'm going to be instructing my staff to contact the Department of Labor and inquire about the status of the complaint that you made in February to the Office of Inspector General regarding the abuse that you received by your H-2B uh, employer. It may take longer than we'd all like the new, uh, for this new administration to make changes, but we're going to hold them to their promise to protect workers' rights. Uh, what is the single most important protection you feel would help assure guest workers uh, do not experience the difficulties that you've had? What kind of protection do you think would be necessary? Bueno, este, que no pertenecer a un solo patrón en cuanto a lo que es la visa H2B, eh, mente, en mi mente está de que mi visa solo pertenecía a un solo patrón y yo no puedo trabajar en otra compañía. Lo que quiero es tener la libertad de poder trabajar en diferentes compañías, no pertenecer a un solo patrón. Yeah, that would be the fact that I belong to one boss. And the change would be that we would have the freedom to work for other companies, not just the boss that brought us here. Thank you very much. Uh, to um, uh, Mr. Castellanos Contreros, as an organizer for Alliance of Guest Workers for Dignity, have you ever met with the Department of Labor about improving its outreach and enforcement of the uh, rights of guest workers? Como organizador de la Alianza, hemos tenido muchas muchas veces hemos ido al Departamento de Labor a tratar de, de llevar casos de, de otros de otros grupos de personas, de otros trabajadores en diferentes estados. As an organizer, we've gone to the Department of Labor many times trying to bring cases to them uh, in different states. Pero so, ellos siempre <laughs> nos rechazan la, la, las, los pedidos que le hacemos diciendo que no les compete. But they always deny uh, taking action on these cases saying that it's not their responsibility or jurisdiction. Que es, una, que es una responsabilidad del Departamento de Seguridad del Estado, porque nosotros no somos nacionales, somos inmigrantes. Uh, they've told us that it's the responsibility of uh, the State Department, because we're immigrants, not nationals. Pero leyendo la ley me, me he dado cuenta que, que nosotros tenemos, que venimos con visas temporales de trabajo, tenemos los mismos derechos que un trabajador americano en el tiempo que estamos uh, legales acá. Even though reading the law, I know that as temporary workers, we have the same labor rights as any American. And, and I, uh, I thank you. I want to ask one final question, and that is, did the Department of Labor ever investigate charges that Decatur violated the Fair Labor Standards Act by retaliating against you? No. 
No, ellos no, no did, did uh, you have any contact with the Department of Labor about that? About that case? Tuvimos algún acercamiento en un tiempo atrás, pero ellos en lo absoluto respondieron. Uh, we did have some contact, but the Department of Labor never Nothing uh, was done, nothing. Did anything. Nguna, nothing. No. Okay, thank you uh, for your testimony. We're going to now uh, move to questions from the ranking member, Mr. Jordan. Thank you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you for your, your testimony. Uh, let me just ask a couple of basics first. How, how long have each of you been in the United States? Bueno, nosotros como política de, de la Alianza hemos sido invitados acá a, a tratar el tema de, de, de los, los cambios de, regula, de las reglas de, de la visa y no creemos como política de la alianza creemos que eso no, no, no nos compete no es you know we've been invited to discuss um, improvements to the laws of the H2B program and as a politic, as a policy of the alianza uh, we don't really think that's an appropriate question okay okay How, how long he's been in this country? I don't know how long that. No, no. no, no. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you this: Have, have you, or would you, reapplied uh, for the H two B visa? Bueno, no, yo no puedo decir la experiencia de lo que ha pasado a otra persona. Bueno, en el caso de, de yo como organizador he visto mucho de, de la gente que aplica muchas veces para que poderse quedar acá. As an organizer, I have seen guest workers that reapply many times to come and work here. Porque en el tiempo que en el corto tiempo que le dan de visa no tiene la capacidad para recuperar el dinero que, que gastaron para It, poder venir a los Estados Unidos. Because in the very short time uh, that they're given the visa for, they don't have the ability to recuperate the money that they paid to come. Y ellos y esto crea un círculo vicioso en el cual hay muchas personas, hay muy pocas personas que ganan dinero por esto, y, pero los trabajadores no ganan nada en lo absoluto. And so it creates a vicious circle where understand, people understand. are forced to continue to pay to uh, uh, the uh, come is, back to the country. Have any, of the, any of the witnesses on, on this panel, have, you, have any of you reapplied or would you, would you consider reapplying based on the experience you've had, uh, the experience you've testified to? Bueno, yo creo que, que eso, eso es, no... No, claro, es, eso básicamente no está... No, es una política de alianza de no contestar ese tipo de preguntas. No uh, lo vemos pertinente, ¿no? Again, we're just going to have to say, as a policy of the alliance, okay. we don't comment on individual immigration status. Okay. Enrique Barayano, la de... Inim, H2B, que apply a la alianza de la alianza de la alianza de la alianza de la alianza if you're asking me, will I apply again? I, if it is this same way that I'm coming, I have no more homes to sell or nothing else That's left okay. in my life. Um, I would not come here under this circumstance again. If, if you could, and, and I don't care which which the witnesses takes this question, but uh, talk to me more about this recruitment process. Who the recruiter is? Uh, it sounds to me they're getting like they're getting compensated, um, basically from both sides. The em potential employers are compensating their recruiter to find workers. You're having to pay to come to the uh, United States, and I know there's been some changes there, but. Uh, Talk to me a little bit more about that, and I, and I know we're going to explore this issue with the second panel, but was interested in your thoughts on the recruitment process. And I, I, I've got the general just, but if you can go into it just a little bit more, I, I think that'd be helpful. And I don't care who, who, whichever one of our witnesses wants to go. But my time is running, so one of you jump in there. <laughs> Mr. Raju, go ahead, if you'd like to. Or Mr. Uh, it doesn't matter. Bueno, nosotros, eh, bueno, nosotros como, como experiencia que tenemos, la experiencia personal y experiencia de las personas que, que, que vemos a diario, 
Hemos visto que esto del reclutamiento es un, es un negocio total. We've seen that the recruitment process is, is totally the country you came from, your native country, or is it recruiter United, a company here in the United States? How is how is it typically done? I, esto, esto, esto es una cadena que, que, que comienza desde los Estados Unidos y va a, va a nuestros países. It's, re, it's really a chain that starts in the United States and then comes to our countries. Hay reclutadores locales en Estados Unidos y hay los reclutadores en nuestros países de origen. Mm -hmm. There's local recruiters in our home countries. Donde todos donde todos ellos ganan dinero de nosotros and everybody is taking money from us y nosotros no recuperamos absolutamente nada and okay. we're unable to recuperate eh, repito, anything repito es un negocio I repeat you know it's a business yeah this no, I understand that okay Mr. Chairman I, I, well, I thank you the, I thank the gentleman for his question and actually I mean that's something that uh, this subcommittee is it's worthy yeah, it's of a little bit closer look because uh, you raise an interesting point are people making money from both sides here you definitely are and that's, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jordan. Chair recognize Mr. Foster. Um, let's see, I guess this would be um, for Mr. Raju. Um, did you have difficulty contacting the um, Department of Labor? Um, you know, do you, is there an 800 number? Um, do, do most members, um, most of the people in your situation have a cell phone? Or, or is there an impediment to even making contact with anyone who will help you? ഈ രാജ്യത്ത് വന്നതിന് ശേഷം ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ഇവിടുത്തെ നിയമങ്ങളോ കാര്യങ്ങളോ ഒന്നും അറിയില്ലായിരുന്നു സിൻസ് കമ്മിങ് ടു ദിസ് കൺട്രി വി ഹാഡ് നോ ഐഡിയ ഓഫ് ദ ലോസ് ഓർ ദ വേസ് ഓഫ് ദിസ് ലാൻഡ് ഇവിടെ വന്ന് വന്നപ്പോൾ തന്നെ ഞങ്ങൾ വളരെയേറെ ലിവിങ് കണ്ടീഷൻസെല്ലാം വളരെ മോശമായിരുന്നു ഞങ്ങൾ അത് ഇമ്പ്രൂവ് ചെയ്യാൻ പറഞ്ഞപ്പോൾ പറഞ്ഞ് ഈ രാജ്യത്തിൻ്റെ നിയമപ്രകാരമുള്ള ലിവിങ് കണ്ടീഷനാണ് ഇതെന്ന് പറഞ്ഞ് When we came here, the living conditions were horrible, and we asked for it to be improved, and they said, this is the living condition of this land. It's according to the laws of this land that you're living this way. We did not even know which departments exist to protect us. And we didn't have the number or information, so we were unable to contact them. Yeah, was there... And did you receive any information at all about what your rights are as, as a worker? No, I didn't have any information about the normal companies. I didn't have any harassment or contact. I didn't have any information about the guest worker. I didn't have any information about the paper or the guest worker. No, we never got any papers or anything that said it. Sometimes in companies they say, if you're harassed, you can call this number. But we never got any information like that, even hanging up in the companies. One last question. Um, Mr. Raju, can you weld aluminum? Aluminum weld in, but do. Aluminum, yeah. carbon steel, uh, uh, stainless steel. All right, you have my respect. <laughs> um, particularly aluminum. One of the most humiliating experiences of my life was um, trying to weld aluminum. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, Mr. And, and if the gentleman would yield, I mean, I, I know you're speaking not only as an um, amateur aluminum welder, but also as a physicist. Um, Mr. Lopez, um, are you aware of any labor brokers that actually do a good job and treat their workers fairly? Hasta ahorita yo solo conozco lo que es a mi patrón, lo que hizo conmigo y no conozco a nadie más que que haya tratado a un trabajador honestamente que Solo conozco a mi patrón por cara, pero por nombre también lo conozco. You know, I only know uh, my own boss, and I know how he's treated me and what he's done to us. Um, I actually only know him by name, not by face. Uh, I don't know any other uh, bosses that have treated workers well. 
Okay, and Mr. Castellanos Contreras, um, how are these debts enforced? Um, are they enforced against the, your families back home? Are they enforced in the United States? Do you have to put all the money up front so that you become indebted to third parties? Or how exactly does the debt enforcement work? Bueno, lo de la deuda, que es, un, que es lo que nos pasa a todos los trabajadores huéspedes, eh, desgraciadamente uno lo tiene que pagar todo a, a, al principio. En términos de la deuda que uh, pasa a los trabajadores, tienes que pagar todo en el frente. Como le dije, en, en, much, en muchos países pobres como el, como, como el de nosotros, no, no contamos con ese dinero. En muchos países pobres no tenemos ese tipo de dinero. Kind of tenemos que, que vender muchas de nuestras pertenencias. So we sell our things. Pedir pré préstamos a, a, a los bancos. We borrow money from banks. O en lo peor de los casos, pedirle dinero a prestamistas que te cobran una tasa de intereses demasiado alta. O en the more common and, and worst case is when you get loans from loan sharks that charge huge interest rates. Y todo por la, la porque porque los reclutadores nos, 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 ponen, nos pintan buenas, muy, muy bonitas ideas y que, que vas a recuperar el dinero muy pronto. And all because the recruiters promise you that you're going to recuperate this money very quickly. Y, pero como al no ser cierto, tú, te llegas a endeudar de tal forma de que este, te sientes atrapado por eso y eso es lo que te, te, no te permite de protestar en contra de un maltrato de, de, de los patrones. But when you find that what the recruiter told you was a lie, your debt is growing hugely, and that's what prevents you from protesting or from raising your voice against the abuses that your boss is doing to you. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Foster. I want to thank the witnesses for taking time to share your experiences with this subcommittee. And it is clear that the Department of Labor failed to adequately protect your rights. When people come to this country and use a legal, pro a legal process to get here, they should be entitled to the protections of law. You are not. The recommendations you've provided for how the Department of Labor can better ensure guest workers' rights are insightful, and this committee will continue to press the Department of Labor to take uh, actions that would protect uh, the rights of workers. In many ways, I, I, I believe workers' rights are human rights. Yo creo es muy importante pelear por los derechos de los trabajadores. So I thank you very much for being here. And uh, the first panel is dismissed. Let's go to the second panel. Thank you. Thank you. It's time to hope. As the uh, second panel is getting into place, I'd like to begin the introductions of the second panel. We have Mr. Saket Sony, is co-founder of and organizer for the New Orleans Workers' Center for Racial Justice and a member of the Advancement Project, the Workers' Justice Center for Racial Equality, and the New Orleans Worker Justice Coalition, which is an independent community-based organization advocating for and organizing workers in post-Katrina New Orleans. Mr. So Sony also works to bring together immigrant Latinos and displaced New Orleanians. He's co-author of a book called And Injustice for All, a comprehensive documentation of the conditions for workers in post-Katrina New Orleans. Ms. Mary Bauer is the director of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Immigrant Justice Project, now located in Atlanta, Georgia. The Immigrant Justice Project represents guest workers and other low-wage immigrant workers in high-impact cases in nine states in the South. Ms. Bauer is the author of Close to Slavery, 
guest worker programs in the United States, published in 2007, and Under Siege, Life for Low-Income Latinos in the South, published in 2009. Prior to joining the Southern Poverty Law Center, she was the legal director of the Virginia Justice Center for Farm and Immigrant Workers and legal director of the Virginia ACLU. Catherine Ruckelshaus is legal co-director at the National Employment Law Project in New York City. Her primary areas of expertise on behalf of low-wage workers are the labor and employment rights of contingent and immigrant workers. Ms. Ruckelshaus co-founded the National Wage and Hour Clearinghouse, dedicated to advancing labor standards for all workers. Among recent cases, Ms. Ruckelshaus was lead counsel in the class action Ensumana versus Cristedes, a Fair Labor Standards Act case brought on behalf of nearly 1,000 West African immigrant grocery delivery workers against the contracting services who hired them and the stores who employed them. That case netted over six million in unpaid workers for the uh, wages for the workers. Patrick A. McLaughlin is a PhD research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Washington University, which he joined in the summer of 2008. He was previously a graduate research fellow at the Property Environmental Research Center. Dr. McLaughlin's research interests include environmental and homeland security regulations. Some of his current research is particularly focused on the consequences of regulatory actions on small business, foreign direct investment, and trade flows. He's been published in World Economy and Regulation Magazine. I want to welcome this distinguished panel of witnesses. It is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you now rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you for being here, Mr. Sony. Let's start with your testimony. I would, uh, again, remind the witnesses that your entire testimony will be included in the record of this hearing. I ask that you keep your testimony to uh, try to keep it around five minutes or under five minutes. That would be appreciated. Please proceed, Mr. Sony. Katrina, of the thank you of the post-Katrina reconstruction. Um, I also want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to talk about how this exploitation has been directly enabled um, by the inadequate response and indeed the abject absence of the Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division. My name is Saket Soni. I am the executive director of the New Orleans Workers Center for Racial Justice, um, and in 2007. We founded the Alliance of Guest Workers for Dignity, um, the only organization in the United States that is membership driven, um, that brings guest workers together on H-2B visas across many industries, sectors, and countries. Our members come from around the globe, including the Dominican Republic, Mexico, Peru, El Salvador, Brazil, Bolivia, and India. Um, in the last three years, we have had hundreds of consultations conversations um, and interviews with guest workers. Um, facing severe labor exploitation in a vacuum of federal worker protections, um, our members have organized and exposed exploitation within this program. Since Hurricane Katrina, hundreds of our members have also brought four major lawsuits against employers um, whose abuse is exemplary of the realities of this guest worker program. Earlier on the last panel, you heard the testimonies of three of our members. Um, I would like to start by sharing with you some of the stories of our members that illustrate the severe exploitation that they face and that expose the pattern of abuse um, that uh, is pervasive in the guest worker program. You all know, of course, the story of Decatur Hotels. Um, Decatur imported workers from Peru, Bolivia, and the Dominican Republic to come to the United States. These workers arrived heavily in debt and faced exploitative conditions. Um, they also faced threats for raising their voice. Patrick Quinn, the luxury hotelier 
who brought these workers from these countries, did it at a time when hundreds of thousands of American workers, African American workers, were displaced from the region. And when hundreds of unemployed African American survivors of Hurricane Katrina were living in his hotels. At this time, the Department of Labor certified him to bring guest workers, agreeing with him that he couldn't find a single US worker willing or able to take these jobs. If Mr. Quinn had wanted to hire US workers, all he would have had to do would be to go to one of the floors of any one of his hotels and knock on the door. Instead, he brought workers to do $14 and $12 an hour jobs at just above $6 or $7 an hour from Latin America on H-2B visas. Meanwhile, um, guest workers in Mississippi and Texas who were brought from India um, escaped a situation of severe labor exploitation and along with other organizations um, brought legal suit in Louisiana uh, against uh, Signal International and an international recruitment chain that plunged these workers into debt, brought them here, and exposed them to exploitative conditions. In Tennessee, while an economic crisis engulfed families in the South, a, uh, a company called Cumberland Environmental Resource defrauded both the U.S. government and guest workers to bring them here. They said there would be work in uh, Tennessee. The workers were brought, and for three months, there was no work. The workers were then leased across the South in several states, astonishingly, even at military bases. Meanwhile, Cumberland represented to the US government that local workers had applied for the jobs, but when they had been offered the jobs, had turned them down. When we interviewed the local workers who had applied for these jobs, every one of the interviewees said that they were in a state of economic desperation when they applied, and they would have gladly taken those jobs. Every one of our interviewees said that uh, if the jobs had been offered to them, they would have taken them. The reality is, though, that these US workers could not have taken the jobs at the wage rate offered and on the terms and conditions offered by the company. <coughs> these stories reveal a pattern of abuse, and they illuminate a structure of exploitation. And I would like to unpack a little bit what hundreds of our members have reported as um, the salient features of exploitation within the guest worker program. The gentleman's we, time has expired. Um, okay. Your complete testimony will be included in the record of this hearing. And we thank you for being here and for making this presentation. But I will assure you that everything that you present to this committee is going to be analyzed and followed up on. Ms. Bauer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of this committee for inviting me to speak about DOL's role in protecting H-2B guest workers. You have heard substantial testimony today about the abuses endemic in this program. I have personally represented and interviewed thousands of guest workers over the course of my career. I can certainly confirm that our experiences representing H-2B workers reveal that the program is deeply flawed. Further, it is clear that the flaws in this program are not the product of a few bad apple employers, but are the product of the very structure of the program and the utter failure of the Department of Labor to take action to, to protect these workers. None of the significant protections that have existed, at least on paper for H-2A workers, for example, have been adopted relative to H-2B workers, as the Department of Labor has never promulgated substantive labor protections for H-2B workers. So there's no requirement for free housing in the H-2B context, no requirement that housing be decent. And when they are abused on the job, H-2B workers are not even eligible for federally funded legal services. Under this system, workers lack the real ability to combat exploitation. Historically, the Department of Labor has taken the position that it could not enforce the H-2B contract. Thus, in their view, if a worker was promised a prevailing wage rate of $12 an hour, but paid only the federal minimum wage, the DOL would take no action. We believed this analysis was simply wrong, but we are heartened that there has been a formal delegation from DHS to DOL to permit DOL uh, to enforce the H-2B provisions. Nonetheless, we should acknowledge the inadequate job DOL has done historically in protecting guest workers under the statutes, such as the Fair Labor Standards Act and the 
Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act, where it has always conceded that it did have the authority. In recent years, for example, when DOL has asked how many investigations of H-2B employers they have conducted, they simply cannot answer that question, respond they don't keep records in those ways. Our experience is that they undertake very few investigations, and when they do, they tend to be limited in scope with little relief for workers. In our written testimony, we laid out some of these examples where the Department of Labor conducted an investigation, issued a modest civil money penalty, waived that penalty in its entirety when the company promised to comply with the law. We came along several years later, filed a class action lawsuit, got that class action certified, won a summary judgment decision, and obtained uh, an expert evaluation of the records that found that major discrepancies were apparent on the face of those records and that workers had been cheated out of something like $20 million. All of this would have been apparent to the Department of Labor had they conducted a full investigation of that company. Unfortunately, the poor track record of protecting H-2B workers is not limited to one administration or to one party. For example, the Department of Labor has historically taken the position that the one-time travel and recruitment costs of migrant workers cannot cut into workers' wages in such a way that caused them to earn less than the minimum wage in the first week of work. This has been the position of the Department of Labor since before 1970. This is an incredibly important rule under the Fair Labor Standards Act to protect guest workers. However, during the 1990s, the DOL announced that while this was still the stated position of the administration, they were adopting a non-enforcement position and the department would decline to enforce this critical part of the law. Worse, the Bush administration tried to actively subvert the law by attaching a preamble to midnight regulations which went into effect in January of 2009. This preamble purported to undo more than 30 years of policy and law in one fell swoop and was never subjected to notice and comment. The regs that were enacted by the Bush administration eviscerated the very few protections which did exist for H-2B workers. Those regs should simply be repealed and the department should promulgate true substantive labor protections which would serve to protect guest workers and U.S. workers in the industries which employ H-2B workers. This deeply, this deeply troubled program requires oversight by Congress. Specifically, we would ask that Congress hold additional hearings on the issue related to the administration of the guest worker programs, and we're heartened that the Secretary of Labor will be back to testify about plans for this administration. In conclusion, the abuses of these programs are too common to blame on a few bad employers. They are the foreseeable outcome of a system that treats foreign workers as commodities to be imported without providing them adequate legal safeguards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bauer, Ms. Ruckelshaus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, today and thank you for holding this hearing. My name is Kathy Ruckelshaus. I'm the legal director at the National Employment Law Project. We're a nonprofit that specializes in access to and keeping good jobs for all workers. We work closely with low wage and immigrant workers, community based organizations and their advocates, in addition to state labor departments, to promote good models for enforcement of labor standards. In our basic work, two trends have emerged recently which touch upon my recommendations today. First, in light of the moribund Federal Department of Labor enforcement, State Departments of Labor and State Attorneys General have stepped into the void. They've launched innovative and effective enforcement programs, including State Departments from, from both Ohio and Illinois, and the models they have enacted I think are good models for us to tap into for federal reforms. Second, following the virulent eight, uh, eight, last 18 months of the Bush administration's workplace immigration raids, immigrant workers and other low-wage workers have virtually stopped coming forward to complain. There's so much fear out there that the complaints simply aren't coming in. Because we have a complaint-driven system in our society, that means enforcement cannot happen because workers are not coming forward to complain. My brief remarks this morning are, are in more detail in the written prepared testimony, but they'll reflect these two trends. For 20 years, I have worked with communities of low-income workers in dozens of job categories to ensure that they get the basics. 
more and more immigrant workers are not coming forward to complain, and there's no one to complain to. The testimony we have heard this morning is just a handful of examples of a larger trend that affects not only the guest workers and their families, but other workers in the same job categories and other employers who have to compete with these same employers who are perpetuating these subpar jobs. The problem is so deep-seated, it touches jobs you see every day, the janitors who clean this building, the housekeepers, home care, and child care workers who tend our homes and our loved ones, servers in the cafeteria in this building, housekeeping staff in hotels, <laughs> construction workers who build and repair these buildings, and the landscapers I passed this morning on my way to the hearing. These jobs do not have to be bad jobs with low pay. There are growth service sector jobs that could be helping create a new middle class with good pay and benefits. We can restore the promise of economic opportunity for these workers and their families by making sure these jobs pay. The Department of Labor, the three GAO reports in less than one year make the point loud and clear. The wage and hour department of the U.S. Department of Labor is not effective. A decade of declining resources has not surprisingly resulted in a decrease in enforcement by one-third, while the number of covered businesses has increased to over 8 million. Wage and Hour Division has recently relied almost exclusively on worker complaints to conduct its enforcement. When this strategy exists in the context of immigration raids in the workplace, it comes as no surprise to us that the complaints didn't come in and enforcement didn't happen. Some other highlights from these recent GAO reports I think are worth noting. These are basic problems. The Wage and Hour Division did not consistently log in worker complaints. And some regions didn't even log in a complaint until there was a successful resolution of a complaint. There's no way to measure progress or hold the department accountable if that information is not available. Delays for workers who did manage to come forward and complain were common and sometimes lasted as long as six months. Some offices only had voicemail and some didn't even have voicemail. This is all detailed in the GAO reports that have come out in the last year. Another problem is that the Wage and Hour Division did not seek any liquidated damages or extra penalties so that if it did capture a complaint and get an employer to pay, the employer just paid what it would have paid the employee had it paid it cor her correctly in the beginning. So now, what about a DOL renaissance? If only employers were as, as afraid of the DOL as we are about of the IRS, then we'd get some traction. Much of the reform proposals listed in my prepared testimony have been enacted by the Department of Labor in the past. They're very simple, and they can send us an important and strong message. Secretary Solis recently noted there's a new sheriff in town. Well, here's how we think she can, she can enact that, uh, that uh, message to employers. First, don't just rely on worker complaints. Department of Labor has done this before. It has targeted problem industries with audits and investigations. Department of Labor had a salad bowl initiative that looked at agriculture. It looked at nursing homes, affirmatively auditing and investigating. And this was very effective, and it can do it again easily. It should use its joint employer powers to go up the food chain when there are multiple subcontractors, as there are in guest worker programs. And it's done it in the past in agriculture and garment cases where it holds other um, employers and subcontractors accountable for the abuses. It can share information on violations with state and federal partner agencies, including the Internal Revenue Service, who cares about independent contractor and off-the-books payments. It also can share with state departments of labor. Maryland, Illinois, Ohio, and New York are among some of the states that are already doing this. Any sharing of this information has to include a firewall between the ICE, the Immigration Service, and Department of Labor. We've uh, heard the, this morning that... I, I'm, the gentlelady's time has expired, but what I'd like to do is okay. if you would uh, just kind of wrap it up okay, in a sorry. couple sentences. Okay, sure. Um, 
the, I have a long list, and I'm, I'm not through it, but what I'll just say is that guest workers and em other immigrant workers cannot police their workforces alone. The Department of Labor is the frontline agency charged with making work pay, and together we can work to make this happen. Thank you. I, I thank the gentlelady. Your uh, ent entire test of testimony will be included in the record, and also staff is going to take note of your suggestions, and we're preparing a memo to the Department of Labor uh, which will include not just the suggestions, but some suggestions from our staff about how we can be more effective in protection of uh, the rights of, Thank you. of guest workers. The uh, chair recognizes Professor McLaughlin for five minutes. Thank you for being here, and you may proceed. Chairman Kucinich. And make sure that mic is close so we can hear you. Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, and distinguished members of the committee, it is a privilege to be asked to testify in this forum today regarding the H-2B guest worker program and consideration of the Department of Labor's enforcement of policies related to guest workers. My name is Patrick McLaughlin, and I'm a research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. I've been invited to share my opinion of what economic effects we should expect if the U.S. mandated that employers must pay certain employee benefits for H-2B workers. Professor, I, we all want to make sure that we hear you. Uh, is your mic's on. I believe it's on. Correct. And just, you know, speak Sorry. closely to it and maybe increase the volume because everyone wants sure. to hear your testimony. I can speak loudly. Thank you. I have two main points to make on this topic. First, mandating benefits for H-2B workers, while well-intended, will have unintended consequences. Second, if the goal is to help H-2B workers avoid possible exploitation, then a free agent model that empowers H-2B workers to switch employers can accomplish this goal while avoiding those unintended consequences. Consider the possibility of mandating that employers pay some benefits for H-2B workers. Regardless of the specific nature of the mandated benefit, it, the effect is always that employers are forced to pay more for each worker they hire. Some or all of these costs may be shifted onto the employee in the form of lower wages. There are two possible scenarios that could result from mandating benefits for H-2B workers that I will discuss. To make these scenarios somewhat more concrete, suppose that the mandated benefit in question is inbound, inbound transport costs. That is, what would occur if employers were required to pay the cost for the employee to travel to the work site? First, consider those employees being paid more than minimum wage or the required prevailing wage. The papers I examined on mandated benefits consistently present the same message. The beneficiaries of the mandated benefits mostly end up paying for the benefits in the form of lower wages. This scenario can only occur, of course, if wages can be lowered. Minimum wage or prevailing wage requirements may prevent this. The second scenario is this. Employers are legally prevented from offering lower wages to H-2B workers. If minimum wage or prevailing wage requirements mean that wages cannot be lowered, then the results are fairly straightforward from an economic perspective. Firms will seek out workers with lower benefit costs. Wage rigidities such as minimum wage decrease the ability of the firm to pass along the cost of mandated benefits to employees and can lead to greater unemployment. As Larry Summers put it, quote, suppose that there is a binding minimum wage. In this case, wages cannot fall to offset employers' cost of providing a mandated benefit, so it is likely to create unemployment, end quote. In the second scenario, <clears throat> the effect would be that potential employees that are geographically distant would be less likely to be hired compared to to potential employees that are physically closer or compared to employees who circumvent legally mandated benefits such as illegal immigrants. This suggests two implications of mandating benefits. First, while those workers who receive the mandated benefits would be made better off, some employers may opt to hire fewer H-2B workers because they now cost more. As a group, it is not clear that H-2B workers are made better off. While those lucky enough to get jobs with benefits may be better off, there will be less jobs to go around. Second, employers may choose to replace them with native workers or illegal immigrant workers. So while one consequence of mandating benefits for H-2B workers may be to make native workers relatively more competitive, another presumably unintended consequence would be to increase demand for illegal immigrant workers. Finally, if the goal is to extend more benefits for H-2B workers or to at least avoid exploitation, one other policy that should be explored is the free agent model, that is, allowing H-2B workers to transfer their H-2B visa from one employer to another. 
This would encourage employers to compete for their services. If demand for H-2B workers is greater than the available supply, which is constrained by the H-2B visa cap, a free agent model would allow employers to bid for employee services so that employees will end up in the job that is highest value to the economy and highest paying to the employee. I thank you again for inviting me here today. Uh, we thank you very much for being here. We're going to move to questions of our second panel. I would like to start with Mr. Sony. Have, have you seen any improvement in the amount of staff and resources available to Department of Labor's New Orleans office and Gulf Coast region since our hearings in 2007? Make sure the mic's on and bring it close. We have not seen any significant increase or improvement in staff capacity, and we have certainly not seen uh, any improvement in staff outreach or staff contact with community um, since the last hearing, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Bauer, given your work as uh, guest worker on uh, guest worker issues nationally, uh, the testimony that you've heard today, do you think that it reflects the problems in the guest worker program nationally? Are these uh, aberrations and just sensational stories that do not really reflect the conditions that are going? I, I think there's no doubt that these are problems that are the product of the structure of this program. The cases we've been involved in, many of them are national class actions, workers working not just in the South, but the Northwest, all over the country, and they report the identical kinds of problems that, that flow from this program. Well, in your testimony, you attached as an exhibit an article and study by the Economic Policy Institute, which found that in seven occupations, with the most H-2B workers, Unemployment was higher and had risen faster since 2000 than the national average, while wages were lower and had risen more slowly than the national average. Now, the Institute attributes this to the H-2B program, allowing employers to look overseas for workers who are willing to take lower wages. Do you agree with this conclusion? What are the steps that the Department of Labor needs to take in its certification process to ensure that the H-2B program does not lower wages for U.S. workers. I, I do agree with that conclusion, and I think EPI did an excellent job in showing very concrete examples where workers were being paid and getting certified at dramatically less than the prevailing wage rate. And one of the problems I think that we're looking at is that in 2005, the Department of Labor changed the methodology for determining the prevailing wage rate, and, and wages plummeted 2 to $3 per hour sort of in a typical case as a result of that change in methodology. The, the Department of Labor needs to look at the way, and, and, I, and I would suggest Congress needs to, to, you know, provide oversight for that process, at the way the pre prevailing wage is being calculated. We've seen many examples where people are earning significantly less than the minimum wage, and these uh, the jobs are getting certified just at the minimum wage when workers are being paid on a piece rate system. Th thank you. Uh, Ms. Reckleshouse, do you believe the lack of enforcement of rights of guest workers has contributed to low wages? I think uh, the lack of enforcement generally has contributed to low wages. It's, it's, I, I think guest workers are a microcosm of the problem that are endemic in, in all of these low wage service sector jobs where there just isn't any enforcement. So I think, I, I guess the answer is yes, but it's not specific to guest worker problems. Well, in your written testimony, you state that the abuse of guest workers is bad for the economy. At this moment in time, certainly everyone here is concerned with improving the economy. Can you explain this statement and give us a better understanding of how improving the treatment of guest workers helps all workers? Yes. Um, what I meant by that statement was that if, if we don't have a wage floor, it means that employers have to compete against other employers with subpar jobs. That hurts other workers in the same sector and even in related sectors. It's bad for the workers and their families because they can't make ends meet. The minimum wage in this country is ridiculously low and the, the annual income that, that it generates just isn't simply enough to live on. And thirdly, it hurts our state and federal coffers because there's payroll taxes not being paid. There's all sorts of other insurance not being paid. So it, it's, it's a vicious cycle. Thank it's you. not bringing anybody out of poverty. Thank you. Just a final question to uh, Professor McLaughlin. Uh, you, I noted you, you sat here and heard the testimony of the previous panel. Uh, do you have any opinion on the Department of Labor's 
failure to curb the abuses of guest workers that we've heard testimony about today. How does that sound to you? You're just sitting there in the audience, and you does it, does it make you feel one way or another about the plight of these I, I, I'm sure that everyone in the audience, including myself, felt some sympathy for the plights of the workers. However, I am not certain whether the fundamental problem here is the Department of Labor's enforcement or lack of enforcement. What I think is the fundamental problem is the inability of the H2B worker to be able to quit one job when he's uh, in a situation he doesn't like and go work for another employer. That's what well, we appreciate you being here to testify. We really do. And uh, I'm going to now turn to uh, Mr. Jordan, the ranking member, for uh, five minutes of question. You may proceed, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Uh, Sonai, um, yeah, one of the things I just want to get clear from your testimony I thought was just was was interesting. You, you talked about during after Katrina, um, many displaced um, residents at the hotel, and yet the Department of Labor approved um, the owner of the hotel bringing in guest workers when there were lots of unemployed people. I think that was your your maybe your exact words right there in the facility that the individual owned. I mean, did, did to your knowledge, did the Department of Labor even ask the question, why don't we start employing the folks who are right here and, and you know, displaced people? <laughs> Was that even brought up? Well, um, uh, to my knowledge, the Department of Labor um, did not really play a role for three years um, post-Katrina. Mm -hmm. And um, from uh, enforcing the most basic wage and hour violation laws uh, to asking the bigger questions mm -hmm. that you're pointing to, why is one group of workers being locked out of post-Katrina New Orleans jobs while another group of workers is brought in and exploited. That was certainly not a question that was asked yeah. by the Department of Labor. It was certainly a question asked by hundreds of workers living unemployed in the hotels, as well as a question asked by hundreds of guest workers brought yeah. to those hotels. Let me, let me quickly go. We've all, you know, I think you've all testified and the first panel certainly about the, the failure, uh, the, the chairman's words in his opening statement were utter failure of the Department of Labor. I think Ms. Ruckel's uh, house talked about over 10 years. So we're talking the Clinton administration, Bush administration, and the current administration, uh, at least for three months. Uh, and yet some of you say you're, you're, you think it's a good move that, DH, that all, the DHS is moving the, 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 that portion of the program to, to the Department of Labor. Do, do you really think the Department of Labor, it, it, things are going to get better? Um, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think um, what we need to do is smart enforcement. So mm -hmm. assuming there's always going to be not enough resources to do enforcement, the strategies have to be smart about, and make an impact. So collaboration, partnering, leveraging what we have, that, that's what I think has to change. And it seems that there's a glimmer of hope in this administration that that can start to happen. Let me quickly to one other thing. I want to, I want to bring up uh, the professor's point, um, the free agent concept. Um, I mean, to me, that does seem like, you know, when you talk about worker empowerment, uh, putting aside the problems that we've been outlined here and experience with the recruiters and, and the lack of enforcement is from, uh, from the Department of Labor, um, your thoughts on that, uh, that concept, the free agent concept that uh, the professor has, has brought up? Well, I would say that uh, there are um, four levels at which intervention has to be made in order to empower guest workers and make the Department of Labor relevant to the lives of guest workers. First of all, there has to be an intervention at the level of debt. Um, whether or not workers are a free agent, if they come to the United States indentured to a large debt, it will not help them move from one shipyard to another. Um, secondly, there has to be intervention at the level of workers being tied to one employer, which is what um, the gentleman is, is addressing. Um, that, however, um, uh, can easily break down um, in the present state that shipyards, the service industry, and other industries across the South exist. There would have to be a real compliance mm -hmm. with that rule. Uh, the third thing I would say um, is that workers at the moment um, are very clear that their legal status is tied to their employment. Um, during periods of an employment, for example, what is a worker to do? He can't come forward and report labor abuse if he doesn't have the next employer to go to. I mean, obviously, that to be, if, if, there, if there was the change, that would be an education component I mean, involved. Ms. Bauer, you haven't, you haven't spoke yet, so go ahead. 
Well, we agree that having a visa be portable to another employer is would be an incredible improvement in this mm -hmm. program. And if, if that is coupled with a serious regulation of recruitment and travel costs, that would make an enormous difference. You really I think. think we can get at the recruitment issue because it strikes me as we can we can say you know you, you, the, the the individual seeking to come here can't can't you know someone can't collect a fee from them, but there's there's gonna be that incentive it seems like to me for folks in their in their native country wanting to unfortunately exploit them and, and take take some money. Well, well, that that happens. There's no doubt that that happens. The the question is, you know, is the employer who chooses that recruiter responsible? If that happened in the United States, there's okay. no doubt that if an that if an employer's workers are you know demanding kickbacks from other employees, that that the the employer's going to be on the hook for yeah. that. Let me ask one other. I got 30 seconds. One, one and any of you can grab this. You know, this is just a general. I don't know kind of thing. Um, what kind of background check is done on the H two B? Um, applicants because in the earlier panel we heard that one and I forget and maybe it was Mr. Lopez worked on a military base um, so what kind of background check are done for for these individuals how extensive it's it's very minimal I mean pe people have to submit um, the, the thing that uh, the State Department is largely concerned about is to make sure that people do not overstay visas that's the that's yeah, the level that's of inquiry and so okay. the question is have you overstayed visas in the past um, that's that th that's the inquiry that's going on okay Thank you. If I, if I may, uh, uh, to my uh, colleague, it seems that the only qualification is someone's willingness to work for cheap wages or okay. maybe, or maybe to put themselves in a position where they're not even going to get paid, which is abhorrent. The chair recognizes Mr. Foster. When I listen to the descriptions of the problems with the wage non-payment and cheating, as well as you know tax fraud and minimum wage violations, this sort of stuff, I wonder if there's any merit or if it's ever been considered um, to have some a third party hold the wages in escrow or perhaps post a bond so you know the wages will be actually there, or um, maybe have a third party perform the payment so that actually there's some some record of this. And are there any um, any initiatives along those lines that would at least guarantee that? Um, it seems to me that would have two merits, one of which would be it would prevent a deal from getting struck which relied on on the employer's intention to not really pay these people properly, that that would just discourage it from the start. I wonder if there are any, any sort of initiatives along those lines that have been contemplated. Anyone? I do not believe such initiatives exist. I mean, we have certainly, we suggested in our report that um, employers should be required to post a substantial bond to guarantee that there would be money to pay workers. Um, I, I know of no um, uh, serious proposals at the national level that would make that happen. Okay. And in regards to this discussion of the free agent model, um, is there a way um, that any of you see to prevent uh, an abuse from having people, um, you know, basically you have some determination that there's a shortage of workers in some area in some region, and then if you really have free agents, they'll immediately jump to some other region, some other industry, and it won't be two equivalent shipyards interchanging. Um, and, and so isn't that a real complication with this? That, that when, when you um, said, okay, I want to go to this other employer, you'd have to say, okay, now, is this employer um, in a similarly situated labor market? I mean, I think, I think if you do have visa portability, you have to change some of the fundamental premises of the program, because it, th then it, it's not necessarily no longer this employer who needs guest workers who can't find other workers here in this country. I mean, there really needs to be uh, an industry assessment um, and a geographic assessment of industries, sectors, and geographies that need temporary workers. Um, there would probably be a way to construct um, the ability of uh, workers to move back and forth within employers, uh, you know, within those sectors. The, the thing that hundreds of members of our, our organization will testify to, though, is that without the ability to change from one employer to another, they have no ability to negotiate um, and they have no leverage with their employers. If I might, Secretary, former Secretary of Labor Ray Marshall has suggested the creation of a kind of independent agency to determine need in just this kind of circumstance that would not be an employer-driven um, agency, but that would be a U.S. agency that would evaluate whether seasonal workers were really required and where. 
if I may also comment on that briefly, it seems like it's fundamentally an engineering and information problem that you're addressing. Uh, the, the incentives for both the employers and employees are obviously well addressed when free agent, the free agent model is adopted. Now, the complications of adopting that model, I think, are, are, have been to some degree addressed previously. How do you get the information about where em free agent employees are to potential employers? But I don't think that changes the fundamental incentives. Yeah, well, I, I must say I, I found your um, your attraction for this um, free market concept that somehow we have agents with perfect information and perfect language skills and everything else that would be necessary for that to happen is sort of um, interesting. Um, I, I was wondering in terms of the, um, the, I was disturbed by the failure to even log in complaints that was mentioned, I guess, in um, Ms. Ruckel's song. And I was wondering if some sort of daylight or public scrutiny is relevant there. I don't know if these, these have to be private complaints um, or, or would it be all right with the typical complainee if they actually just sat there and, and dumped it on the internet so that this was visible to everyone, that this was an unresolved complaint? I mean, I think it's it's deeper than that because it's there's nothing even there to post up on the internet right now. That because the offices aren't collecting the most basic intake information, there that's the first step is just to get them to log in, you know, what the complaint is and what the claim is. Then there would be a question of how much there, there's proposals to put employer scoff law employers up on the web so that employees can see, oh, I'm owed money, or he's already paid money for me. I th so I think there are privacy concerns, but those can be dealt with. Um, the government agencies get data. Your offices have constituency uh, data coming in all the time from calls from constituents. Just, we're talking about really basic, simple stuff that I think shouldn't be a problem. Do, do you know if the Department of Labor, Labor maintains a, a publicly searchable database of debarred employers or, or people who have abused or defrauded employees? So the the prevailing wage section of it does, but the other parts do not because the data is not there. Okay, thank you. Yield back. I want to thank the witnesses and this panel. Uh, your testimony is something that uh, each member of this subcommittee will take careful note of. Our staff will pour over it to come up with recommendations to the Department of Labor. I want to thank each and every member of this panel for their presence here and for their thoughtful testimony. I would um, uh, like you to know that this subcommittee will retain jurisdiction over this. I have talked to the ranking member and we're going to look for ways that we might be able to make um, joint recommendations to the Department of Labor. I also want to say as the chairman of this subcommittee, the uh, people who are involved in the offenses who have apparently not yet been called to uh, legal accounting, uh, will, uh, the subcommittee will continue to uh, look at the process that has caused them to escape accountability. I'm uh, Dennis Kucinich, chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. I'm joined by the ranking member of the committee. Uh, Representative Jordan of Ohio. Uh, and of course, we're here with Mr. Foster from Illinois, who's uh, been here throughout this hearing. This has been a hearing of the subcommittee on the H-2B guest worker program and improving the Department of Labor's enforcement of the rights of guest workers. Uh, this is one of a series of hearings by the subcommittee on this subject. I want to thank each and every one of the members of the panel and the previous panel for their testimony. I uh, thank you very much for your presence here today. This subcommittee stands adjourned.
The gentleman reserves. Does any member claim time in opposition? To I claim time in opposition to the amendment. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I certainly appreciate the thrust of the gentleman from Illinois' amendment in terms of trying to stop duplication of programs and save money. We need to be doing that every day. Um, the irony is this is what this bill does. This bill looks at the 20 programs or 20 agencies that um, invest in water research and coordinates that so we can get our best bang for the buck. It also helps to do away with that type of duplication. So um, as well intended as the gentleman is, his amendment, I'm afraid, would be contrary to what he wants to accomplish. It would only slow down the process of this coordination, slow down the process of, uh, uh, of better uh, utilizing our resources and, and saving that money. So it really is, again, with the best of intentions, this amendment, uh, I think, would counter that. Uh, not being a member of the committee, he did not have the benefit of the, the hearings that we had, the, the roundtable discussions that we had, all the input uh, that we had. And I think uh, uh, that's the reason uh, that he also might not be aware of the wide endorsements of this bill. This bill is endorsed by the National Beverage Association, the National Rural Electric Cooperatives Association, the Water Innovations Alliance, the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Water Environmental Research Foundation, the Council of Scientific Society Presidents, Food and Water Watch, the Water Research Foundation, the Alliance uh, in, uh, for Environmental and Clean Water Action. Uh, again, we uh, tried to follow his advice uh, and accomplish that, and I think this bill does and uh, has uh, uh, really wide and active support and his amendment would only stop that implementation or slow it down, which would certainly be counter to his intention. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Illinois. Well, I thank the gentleman for his comments, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I, would, I would just go to the underlying purpose of the, uh, of the legislation as it's, as it's sort of the declared statement of the committee, that is to improve the federal government's role in designing and implementing federal water research development demonstration, data collection and dissemination, education, technology transfer activities to address changes in the water use, supply and demand in the U.S., including providing additional support to increase water supply through greater efficiency and preservation. But there's one word that isn't in there, and that is the word duplication. Um, and I think sometimes we all benefit from another perspective coming in, and I respect greatly the resource, I respect greatly the the expertise of the committee, but every once in a while there, there's maybe another perspective that can come along and say, you know what, in, in the great scheme of things, the, the pace at which Congress is moving, the pace at which uh, programs are being put in place, uh, let's hit the pause button here and let's, let's have the GAO go out and really span the spectrum because in the underlying legislation it, it is absolutely silent as to duplicative efforts. So I accept, that, I, I accept the criticism at face value, it's a valid argument, but I think that this is an improvement, it's not meant to be an impediment and clearly it empowers the President of the United States uh, to waive the finding. And I think it's a simple, straightforward type of thing that's in spirit with the inaugural uh, statement of the President. And I uh, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves, the gentleman from Tennessee. Uh, let me just, um, I, and I yield my time, such time as I may con uh, consume. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, let me point out on section two, um, paragraph three, uh, in section three, um, uh, part of the bill says uh, the technical innovation activities to avoid duplications of effort and to ensure optimum use of resources and expertise. And let me say, I, I hope you did not, you, you said criticism of your amendment. I hope you did not take that as criticism. Again, I compliment the thrust of your, uh, uh, your amendment, but we have incorporated that here. And let me also say, that there is a synergy oftentimes also with research. NASA and NOAA may be working on a similar project, but just because they're working on something similar, uh, you would not necessarily, not, not necessarily say that it was duplicative and not useful, but rather there was a synergy of working together. But in our bill, we specifically say avoiding that duplication. Uh, and so, again, I, I think you have the best intentions, and I think that we have accomplished those. And um, uh, for that reason, uh, I would have to oppose your amendment because it would stop us from getting on to the work of, uh, of saving money and having 
uh, a program that is so important. There are 40 states in, the, in, our, in our nation right now that are facing serious water shortages or droughts or water problems between now and the year 2013. And I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves, the gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield one minute to the gentleman from, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of the amendment. Actually, this amendment seeks, as the gentleman has uh, expressed, to return us to the original purpose of the bill by focusing on the duplication that exists among federal agencies involved in water research efforts and attempting to streamline these efforts. I think we always have to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars as we work through legislation up here. I support the amendment because I believe it's a good amendment and it's looking at after the taxpayers. I urge my colleagues to join me. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Tennessee. I yield the balance of my time. Or don't, okay, uh, then uh, I, I yield back uh, my time. The gentleman of Tennessee yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Illinois. 